Okay, before I start today, just a couple reminders. Um, so this Friday is going to be our first exam review. Uh, it'll be 2 p.m. And the room is going to be SEC 102. So it won't be in here. It'll be in a different room, a better room, if you ask me. Um, that's where it'll be. And it'll be recorded and placed on YouTube sometime that late afternoon or early evening, depending on how long it takes to get all that together. Um, so the files for that are already posted, or at least the, the blank file that would have all the questions we're going to go over. And I encourage you to come if you're able to. And then, of course, um, that means the exam would be coming up shortly after that, so don't forget about that. It looks like, I, I checked CASA today, it looks like all of you signed up for a time, which is great, so we don't have anybody straggling and trying to scramble for a time that works for them. So you should already know what time you're supposed to go, so make sure you pay close attention to that. Um, and that's gonna be in the garrison location of CASA. So if you've taken CASA exams before, you might be familiar with that there's more than one location, there's at least two or three different CASA locations, um, and we have no control over which one they give us. So this semester, it looks like we're going to be in Garrison, which is the one that's kind of a kind of a little bit far from here. It's it's over by the basketball arena. So make sure you know where that is and go to the right place. Also, um, I think we'll probably be there all semester. They usually give us the same location all semester, but again, that's out of my control. Okay, so those are just a couple of reminders about important events happening end of this week and next week, and that takes us to then our Try Hard Tuesday day, which is some tips for those final exam preparations, which you, sh you should all be undertaking in the next week or so. All right, so a lot of this is stuff that I've already gone over multiple times this semester, so there shouldn't be any, re you know, revelations here, but um, I think when you're preparing for an exam, obviously the exams are, are problem-based. They're 20 questions. Each question is all or nothing, meaning you get it right or you get it wrong. So you have to know how to do the problems very efficiently and proficiently. So you want to do as many practice problems as possible. And especially as you lead into your exam preparation, you want to be able to do that without any notes or resources. Because remember, all you get on the exam is a writing utensil, a periodic table, which will be provided, scratch paper, and um, a calculator. So you can bring a calculator of your own. It has to be a scientific calculator. You bring something to write with, obviously, but that's all you can have with you. Um, so make sure you can do the practice problems in that same setting without having to leaf through your notes or check the internet or ask a friend for help. Um, and so there's a lot of different avenues for that. We have all the practice homework assignments. Those are the same question banks as the regular assignments, now opened back up for four more attempts anytime you want to do them. They don't count for a grade. Um, as I said, I'll have my own exam review Friday, and there will be a practice exam in Blackboard. Probably will be made available middle to end of this week. I haven't checked yet when exactly we're releasing that, but it'll be a full-length practice exam, one set of questions for everybody, um, and it'll give you an idea of how the exam is going to be formatted. And then in terms of you know group studying, some of you like to do that, some of you don't. It's really personal preference. I think it can be good because generally speaking, if you can, you know, if you can teach somebody how to do something, that means you understand it well yourself. So working in groups and sort of teaching each other is a very effective way to study. But again, make sure as you lead up to the exam, you're doing a lot of individual practice because you're not going to have a group with you on the exam. It's all by yourself, obviously. And if you've been following my recommendations all semester, which is to do all four homework attempts, to study around an hour a day for this class, you should be all, about all set. But again, um, make sure you're reviewing things that we haven't covered in a while, and make sure you're coming to me if you have any questions about um, topics that are going to be on the exam. All right, so I'll be um, I'll be around all next week. I'll try to and I'll announce some modified office hours for the exam week since I know a lot of you want to come see me right before your exam or right after, so I'll try to expand that a little bit and have some more clarity on that by the end of this week. All right, so what we're going to do today is we're going to finish up the very last topic of Chapter 3, which we didn't get to last time, and this is going to be the very last topic that will be covered on the exam, which is acids. Now, at this point, all we're doing is naming acids. We're, we're going to talk, we're going to have a whole chapter, or at least a whole part of a chapter later on that deals with the chemistry of acids and their counterparts, which are called bases. Um, but for now, we just need to recognize what they look like in terms of their chemical formula and be able to name them properly. This is a continuation of the nomenclature stuff that we learned last time. So a general definition of an, of an acid, which we'll get into more detail, as I said, later in the course, it has an anion, so it's going to look, uh, and it's going to be paired with H+. So basically the formula of an acid is going to start with H, hydrogen, and then it's going to have one of our common anions after that, either, either the sort of regular monoatomic anions that we would predict from the periodic table, like fluoride, chloride, bromide, and so on, 
or one of the many polyatomic anions that we have since learned in this chapter, so the sulfate, nitrate, things like that. Um, and essentially what you do is, um, what you'll see in the formula of these compounds is that you have the charge of the anion, which we should all know. You can either predict that from the periodic table or you have to know it if it's one of those polyatomic anions. And you're going to have however many H pluses, however many hydrogens you need to balance that charge. So we'll see examples of this later on, but that's what the formula is going to look like. Now there are two types of acids we're going to talk about and you have to know how to name. So a binary acid looks a lot like a binary covalent compound. It's just two elements, but it's going to start with hydrogen and that's going to be paired with one of those common monoatomic anions, one of those anions that would come from the periodic table where we use the location of the periodic table to predict its charge, all that stuff that we've, that we've talked about. So there's a few common ones that are classified as binary acids. So there's all the halogen acids, HF, HCl, HBr, and then there's a sulfide, H2S, so again sulfide would be S2 minus, so it has two hydrogens to balance the charge. All of these, I guess there's also HI if we want to complete the series um, of those. So those are the, the most common ones. There's a table in your book, you don't have to memorize all of them, but w there is a, a format for naming them. So once you recognize that this formula represents an acid, the formula is as follows. So it starts with the prefix hydro, and then you have the root name of the anion, whatever whatever element the uh, hydrogen is paired with, and then the end of the name is IC, and then a separate word, acid. So it's hydro, root name of the element, ic, IC, and then acid. All right, so for example, HCl, it's going to start with hydro, because it's a binary acid. Cl is chloride, chlorine or chloride, so it's going to be, the root name is Cl is chlor, and then you put the IC at the end, hydrochloric, and then acid. Now, technically speaking, these are only going to be named as acids when they're dissolved in water. Again, we'll talk about that later in the course. So these can also be appropriately named as a binary covalent compound. So calling this hydrogen chloride is not wrong, but in the context where it's behaving as an acid or you're talking about its chemistry as an acid, which we'll again not cover until later, then you would give it the name hydrochloric acid. So those are both acceptable ways to name that, although we're going to stick with the acid nomenclature for the things that we do in this course. All right, and then the other type of acid is called an oxoacid. So this is again going to start with H+, but it's going to be paired with a polyatomic oxoanion. So those are those many polyatomic ions we have now, like nitrate, perchlorate, sulfate, sulfite, etc. And again, the number of hydrogen atoms you have in the formula is going to be however many you need to balance the charge of the anion. Okay, so if we have NO3 nitrate, that's NO3 minus, and so we would need one hydrogen, so HNO3 would be an example of an oxoacid. And then if we have SO4 two minus sulfate, which is a two minus charge, which you have to again just remember from that list of polyatomics, that would need two hydrogens, so that would be H2SO4. Okay, and then um, the sort of naming system for this is the difference with oxoacids is they don't start with hydro. You don't have a prefix in this case, hydro. You just have the root name of the anion, but then the ending of the anion name gets changed. It's either usually it or eight. It's going to get changed to ic or ous, and then you have acid at the end again to make it obvious that we're talking about an acid. All right. So the difference is if you have an anion that ends in ATE, nitrate, sulfate, perchlorate, if you have an ATE anion, that name gets changed to, that, that suffix gets changed to an IC in the name of the acid. So this would be nitric acid. So nitrate is nitric acid, sulfate becomes sulfuric acid. So the ones that have, end in ATE as an anion end as IC when they're named as an acid. And then if you have an ITE anion, nitrite, for example, or sulfite, which are both anions that end in ITE, the ones that have fewer oxygen atoms, that's where you use the OUS. So HNO2, which is another one, which forms from the nitrite anion, would be nitrous acid. So IT becomes OUS. H becomes IC. So when we're naming acids, that's what we're doing. And that's really all we need to know about acids at this point. So let's just do a few examples um, of, of acids just to close out this part of the course. 
So here, again, it can really just go two ways. We either give you the name and you give us the formula, or we give you the formula and you give us the name. That's really all we can ask you. Okay, so for this example here, give the molecular formula for hydrofluoric acid. So the nice thing is if we're giving you the name, you automatically know it's an acid, because it says acid in the name, so that's nice. And then to distinguish what the correct formula would be, a lot of times the first thing you want to focus on is the beginning part of the name. If it starts with hydro, remember that we only use that hydro prefix when it's a binary acid. So a binary acid only has two elements, um, and so these two we can get rid of. It's not going to be one of our oxo acids. So the oxo acids are the ones that have oxygen in the formula with a polyatomic anion, but that's not going to be true for this one. So now we just have two options, HF or FH. And by convention, we always put the hydrogen first in the, in the formula, so this would be the correct way to write that. So that's, again, hydrogen first, then the anion, whenever we're writing the formula of an acid. All right, again, if you wrote FH, it wouldn't technically be wrong, but people would look at you like you're speaking a different language, because it's not how we would write things in chemistry. All right, so that's the molecular formula for hydrofluoric acid. And then, again, again, the other way we can go is we give you the formula. So H2CRO4, so what you need to recognize is the name of the anion. So the number of hydrogen atoms in the formula tells you the charge of the anion, so we don't have to, have to really remember that for this uh, exercise here. So, so it's going to be CRO42- minus is the anion that is partnered with H+. Plus. And that's going to be called the chromate anion. So again, make sure you learn all of these because they're going to be covered in this nomenclature section. And so if it's chromate, all we do for these oxo acids is we don't add a prefix. We just take the root name of the anion, change ATE changes to IC, and then we just add acid at the end. So chromate, which is the anion, would be chromic acid when it's written in this formula with hydrogen. So that's choice C here. All right, so there is no perchromate anion. It would be, it's, there's no, um, chromis would be if it was chromite, and then there's no hydro prefix. So the only one that's correct is choice C here. All right, any questions on acid nomenclature? Okay, so that is the end of exam one material. All right, so you have about a week, plus or minus one day to, to review all that stuff that we've covered up until now for exam one. And so now we're going to move on to chapter four material, which will not be covered until the second exam, but um, is nonetheless still important for us to, to go through. So what we're going to do in chapter four is we've talked about covalent bonding at length in chapter three. We've talked about how to draw Lewis structures that shows the arrangement of all the valence electrons in a covalent molecule, bonding and non-bonding electrons and all that stuff. And then what we're going to do in chapter four is talk about some additional details about the structure and the bonding in covalent compounds. So what are the three-dimensional shapes of molecules? That's what we're going to cover first. And then later in the chapter, we're going to see how are covalent bonds formed? How are these electrons actually shared? What orbitals are involved? Things of that sort. Um, and some and a more advanced bonding theory that really explains things even, even better. Um, so that's what chapter four is going to be, a lot more details about covalent compounds. And for at least half of what we do in chapter four, you need to be able to draw a good Lewis structure. So we've talked about Lewis structures in chapter three. That was a big topic we covered last week. Um, and and you'll, you'll see it on this week's homework assignment for chapter three. You still have to be able to do good Lewis structures to do a lot of stuff we're doing in chapter four. So kind of you know, blends in nicely. So the first thing we're going to do, which does require a Lewis structure, is called VSEPR. And this is the method we're going to use to predict the three-dimensional shapes of molecules. Because Lewis structures, again, they just show a two-dimensional representation. And we don't, we don't live in Flat Folk City. We live in a three-dimensional world. Um, but nobody got that reference, really? Flat Folk City? I'm showing how old I am. It was like a children's toy where they had all these people that were like flat. I mean, the whole, everything was flat. It was like two-dimensional. It was kind of cool. But... I don't know. It was like I, I know my little brother had a had a set one time, and they they had like these little people that were just like they look like gingerbread men, essentially two dimensional people. But anyway, maybe maybe one day I'll have someone in my class that's as old as I am, and they'll get my jokes. Okay, um, so we're gonna do VSEPR first, which is again allowing us to determine three dimensional shapes of molecules. So what does it stand for? This this acronym VSEPR, valence shell electron pair. So this method is going to revolve around 
the electron pairs that are around our central atoms. This is going to be best used for the common structures that we've been talking about where you have a well-defined central atom and then two, three, four, however many outer atoms bonded to that central atom. So we're going to be looking at things from the perspective of the central atom. And so what we're going to do, this is more of a geometric approach. It's not even really chemistry in some level. It's just more like geometry. We have all these valence electrons arranged around the central atom, and we're going to place them around the central atom as far apart as, as possible. Because remember, electrons repel each other, so they want to get as far away from each other as possible. So you're going to figure out how many electron pairs do I have around the central atom, and I'm going to place those as far apart from each other as possible. All right, and so there's kind of two parameters that are going to come out of this when we, when we use the VSEPR approach, two things that we can define that tell us the shape of a molecule. So the first is called the electron group arrangement. So this is going to be the three-dimensional geometric shape that defines all of the bonding and non-bonding electrons around the central atom. So electron group arrangement, again, includes all of the electrons that surround the central atom, whether they're bonding electrons that are shared with another atom or non-bonding electrons that exist as lone pairs on that central atom. Again, for this, we really only care about what's happening at the central atom. The, the lone pairs on the outer atoms don't particularly matter. All right, and so there's going to be five possible shapes that we'll cover, which are all determined by how many different pairs, how many pairs of electrons you have around the central atom. But what we're really more interested in is what's called the molecular shape, and this is going to be the three-dimensional shape that only the bonded atoms occupy, where we basically ignore the lone pairs. Because lone pairs, we can't really see them, I suppose, um, and, all, and a lot of the molecular properties are more determined by the molecular shape. So the three-dimensional shape that only the bonded atoms occupy is called the molecular shape or molecular geometry. And this is another way of saying, what does the molecule look like? Because again, the, 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 the lone pairs on the central atom, they're there. We don't want to discount their importance or completely ignore them. But when we're talking about the shape of a molecule, what we really care about is what is the arrangement of the atoms that are present in that molecule. And the lone pairs we can kind of leave aside when we're just defining what's called the molecular shape. So we're going to learn how to define both of these. And they are closely related to each other. And in some cases, the electron group arrangement and the molecular geometry are the same. So if you have no lone pairs on the central atom, then those two are the same. But if you have lone pairs on the central atom, the molecular shape is going to be related to electron group arrangement, but it's going to be named in a slightly different way. OK, so let's go through and just get a couple more definitions before we go through all the different possibilities in VSEPR. So we're going to use often, I don't know if your book does this or not, but I like to do it anyway, so I think it's a good way of keeping track of things, what's called the AXE notation. So we're going to basically, each chemical compound that we're going to use for VSEPR, every, every you know, possible covalent compound that we, want to, that we want to analyze in this way is going to be broken down into different categories with this notation. So A is a central atom, which doesn't even really need to be there. It doesn't, that, does, that part of the formula doesn't matter. But the key part of the VSCPR approach is to define X and E and how many of them there are. So X is an atom that's bonded to the central atom, and E is a lone pair. Remember, this is valence shell electron pair repulsion, so we're always grouping electrons into pairs in this approach. Um, and so the subscripts M and N tell you how many of each of those you have around your central atom. So hopefully it's clear at this point that you need to have a good Lewis structure because to define the AXE notation, which will tell us both the electron group arrangement and the shape, you need to know how many atoms are bonded to the central atom. That's usually pretty obvious from the formula. But then you also need to know how many lone pairs are in the central atom. That's this E part of the formula here. All right, so again, X and E collectively are referred to as electron groups. And so the total number of electron groups, which is M plus N, is called the steric number. That's what we're going to get to next. So you have to know how many electron groups there are on the central atom to start talking about 
the electron group arrangement and the molecular shape. Both of those, again, depend on that. So the steric number, again, this is a term your book probably doesn't use, but um, this is sort of, you know, by the way I was taught it back in the day. So steric number is the sum n plus n. It's the combined number of electron groups you have in the central atom. And this is an important parameter because it defines the electron group arrangement. And as we'll see, we're going to go through the different possibilities, which are steric number is going to be either 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6 for the, the ones that we need to talk about here. And that total number of electron groups is going to determine the, the electron group arrangements. That's why the steric number is important. Now one thing to note when we're doing this is that the two atoms that are bonded to each other, A and X, the central atom and the outer atoms, as we talked about in the last chapter, they can have different bond orders, single bond, double bond, triple bond, but for the purpose of counting electron groups, that doesn't matter. So whether A is singly bonded, doubly bonded, triply bonded, it doesn't, it just counts as one, sorry, to X, it just counts as one electron group. That X counts as one electron group. Oh man. So it does not, it does not matter really what the bond order is. So no matter what that bond order is, X will always count as one electron group. So when you're doing VSCPR, you don't even need a perfectly complete Lewis structure. You just need to know, again, how many atoms are bonded to the center atom and how many lone pairs are on the central atom. A lot of the details about multiple bonding that we talked about last time or the you know, formal charges and things that we have to analyze, which are important in some contexts, don't really matter for VSCPR. We just need to know how many things are bonded to the central atom and how many lone pairs are on the central atom. And then another parameter in VSCPR that we're going to define is called bond angle. So this is going to be the angle between two outer bonded atoms. with the center atom as the vertex. And these bond angles really just come from geometry. It's not, it's not determined by any sort of real chemical principle. It's just the geometric shape of the molecule that you have is going to define what the angles are between the different atoms. So if, for example, if we have water, what we're going to learn in a little bit is that water takes on a bent shape. So the three atoms in water, H2O, are arranged like this, where they're bent, not linear. And so this angle here, between the two bonded hydrogen atoms with the oxygen as the center point, is defined as our HOH angle, and that's going to be the bond angle in this molecule. And we'll learn what that is, and again, we'll learn how to use the molecular shape to predict what the bond angle will be for a lot of different structures. So that's another parameter we're going to define. So we're going to define the electron group arrangement for all the different possibilities. We're going to define the molecular geometry or molecular shape, and then with that we can predict bond angles as well. Okay, so any questions on the basic principles so far? So what we're going to do for most of the rest of today is just go through all the different possibilities. And so I have a link here for this simulation, which I'm actually going to use in class today to flip back and forth. Um, so this is a very good uh, web-based sort of program for learning the shapes, and especially for visualizing them in three dimensions. Because um, again, we're talking about now the three-dimensional shapes of molecules. It's hard sometimes to draw those accurately on paper, especially if you're someone like me who failed kindergarten because of poor motor skills. So having this sort of three-dimensional interactive type of program allows us to see the shapes a lot better. So we're going to flip back and forth to that. So the first thing we're going to start with is two possibilities where you have two electron groups. So that's going to be either AX2 or AXE, um, which the second one is very trivial as we'll see. Um, but if you have AX2 as your, um, which has two electron groups, let's see how we're going to do this. So again, the idea in VSCPR is going to be we're going to arrange the electron groups as far away from each other as possible. So if you have two electron groups on the center atom, what's the farthest away they can be? Do you think it's like a 90 degree angle or 180 degree angle? Yeah, so basically is it bent or is it like this where they're as far away as possible? So you want them as far away as possible, so that's what we're going to do with two electron groups. That's what it looks like here. If we have two electron groups, they're going to arrange themselves 180 degrees apart and we're going to call that a linear electron group arrangement. And again, it's just three atoms. Um, all right, and so that's what it's going to look like for two electron groups where both of them, in this case, I'm showing are bonded atoms. 
Now, if we replace one of those with a lone pair, let's see if it lets me even do that. Yeah, we'd do that. Then again, those two electron groups, now one of them's an atom, one of them's a lone pair, are gonna still be 180 degrees apart. Now you only have two atoms in the whole formula, okay? So what we call that then is the electron group arrangement is gonna be called linear. Where again, the two electron groups in the central atom are as far apart from each other as possible, 180 degrees. All right, so if we have AX2, again, 180 degrees linear type of arrangement. In this case, the molecular geometry is also called linear. So as we'll see, in every case where there's no lone pairs on the central atom, the electron group arrangement, which is linear for two electron groups, will be the same as the molecular geometry when there's no lone pairs. All right, and the bond angle as we've already talked about, is 180 degrees, okay? And that's linear. Um, and then I'll give examples of these, but this is not so important for now, but an example of this would be CO2. So the, lone, the central atom carbon has no lone pairs, and so you're gonna get this linear AX2 arrangement. In that case, they're both doubly bonded, but again, they still each count as one electron group. So that's AX2, and then AXE is trivial because you only have two atoms in the formula. If you only have two atoms, of course they have to be linear. You can't arrange two atoms in any other way. But if you want to talk about where the lone pair is, that's going to be 180 degrees from the bonded atom because those two electron groups, now one of them is a shared electron pair, one of them is a lone pair, those need to be 180 degrees apart. And so in this case it's also called linear because it's two, two atoms, it has to be. There's no bond angle in this because you need to have at least three atoms to define a bond angle, or exactly three to define a bond angle. So there's no bond angle because there's no second atom in the structure besides the A and the X. And again, we don't have to talk about these in any more detail. All diatomic molecules, H2, O2, N2, HCl, HBr, anything that just has two atoms in the formula, they have to be linear. There's no other way to arrange the two atoms. They may have a different electron group arrangement than linear, but they would have to have a linear geometry. And we're really not going to talk about those because, again, they're trivial and they're not going to come up all that often anyway in this context. Okay, so that's the situation when you have two electron groups. So if we go to three electron groups, let's talk about the electron group arrangement here. So we're going to put three things around the central atom as far away from each other as they can be. And this one is also fairly straightforward to visualize. So you don't need, a, you don't need to be a, a geometry wizard to get this one, I don't think. So if we're gonna put three things around, we're gonna add one more here. Now they're gonna go, and we'll take off a lone pair and add one more. They're gonna go into a triangular arrangement. Okay, so they're gonna be in a perfect triangle around the central atom. If we rotate this, we can see that it's perfectly flat. It's two dimensional. So this one would, would fit in well in Flat Folk City. Um, this is a perfectly flat arrangement of those three atoms. Again, that's the way that we can put them so that they're as far away from each other as possible when you have three things around the central atom. Um, and then if we start replacing one or more of these, or I guess in our case just one of these with a lone pair, um, then that's going to occupy any of these three positions. All three positions are equivalent, so it doesn't matter where the lone pair goes. But again, when you have three total electron groups, you're going to have a triangular arrangement of the three electron groups, and in this case, the three atoms in your formula would be in a bent arrangement because of that lone pair occupying that third position. So those are the two main possibilities for three electron groups. So the electron group arrangement is called trigonal planar. Stop blinking. So it's called trigonal planar, um, and again, it's just a triangle around the center atom. So that's going to look like this. So if we have AX3, where all three of them are atoms bonded to the central atom, again, anytime you have no lone pairs on the central atom, the molecular geometry is the same as the electron group arrangement. So that would also be called a trigonal planar molecular geometry. And the bond angles here are going to be exactly 120 degrees. So if you remember your high school geometry, if you have a triangle, well, if, you have, if you're going around the whole thing, that's 360 degrees. So each angle, there's three of them, is going to be 120. 
All right, so it's 120 degree bond angles for this. Um, and an example of this, if you're wondering what real molecule looks like this, would be BF3. A lot of those boron compounds that have um, the electron deficient, only six uh, valence electrons around the center atom, they would get this trigonal planar geometry. And then if we have AX2E, so whenever we go to one of these structures that has one or more lone pairs in it, we have to decide where the lone pairs go. So the lone pairs actually repel more strongly than the bonding pairs because instead of being shared between two atoms, they're kind of just out there in space and take up more, more room and they have stronger repulsion. So we're going to start with a trigonal planar arrangement because there's three electron groups, two X's and one E, so a total of three. And then when we want to decide where the lone pair goes, we have to make sure that that goes as far away as possible from everything else. Now in most cases, and this one uh, being the first example, the three positions here are all equivalent. It doesn't matter where the lone pair goes. They're all the same distance from everything else. So we can just put the lone pair wherever we want. Um, it makes it easiest to visualize the, um, you know, the geometry if we put it up there. And then you can see that this is what's called a bent geometry. Um, so that would be a bent or V-shaped geometry. I'm trying to think of an example that forms this geometry. Let's see. So I think like NO2 minus would be bent. Hope I haven't admit that. Yeah, it should be right. So anyway, there's examples of pretty much all of these. That's why we're covering them. They're not, they're not just abstract. Um, so we, we'll learn the approach for, for you know, determining the shape from the formula. That's going to come a little bit later. And now the bond angles in this case, if we define the bond angles between the two x's, this angle here, it's going to be close to 120 degrees because this is still from the trigonal planar arrangement. But it's actually going to be a little bit smaller than that. How much smaller depends on what molecule you're talking about, what the A is, what the X's are, and all that. But it's going to be a little bit smaller because, as we said, the lone pair is a little bit more strongly repelling than the bonding pair. So that's going to sort of push down on these bonds a little bit and kind of pinch them a little bit closer together. So they're normally here 120 degrees apart. The lone pair pinches them and they get contracted a little bit and closer together. So the bond angle is going to be not too different than 120, but it'll be a little bit smaller because the lone pair causes that contraction and bond angle. And that's a theme that we'll come back to a little bit later on as well. So you're, going to have, um, so you're going to use the electron group arrangement to predict the bond angles, but when you have lone pairs involved, very often those bond angles are going to be a little bit smaller than they would be if there were no lone pairs in the, in the sort of idealized uh, geometry. All right, so those are the two possibilities for three electron groups. Any questions so far? All right, so now for four electron groups, here's where we have to start thinking in three dimensions. So we're, we're not able to do this in two-dimensional world anymore. So we have to go to three dimensions for this. There's going to be three possible geometries that have four electron groups. So AX4, AX3E, ax 2 E2. So in all cases, four electron groups of total of four X's and E's around the central atom. And so the electron group arrangement in this case is not as intuitive, I would say. So if you're you know, really experienced with geometry and you're really good at thinking of three dimensions, maybe this is obvious to you, but it was never obvious to me when I learned it. Um, and it's one that you kind of just have to learn and visualize. So we're going to put four electron groups on our central atom. So that's two, three, four. Now the shape in this case, as I said, is three-dimensional, and we call it a tetrahedral arrangement. So if you were to draw uh, triangles through each of those three atoms, you would get four sides, which is why it's called a tetrahedron. Um, but it looks kind of like this. It's almost like a, a three-legged stool, if you want to think about it that way. So you have your three legs on the bottom, and then you have... Um, the one going going up from there. So it's like a it's like a pyramid with a flagpole coming out of the top. If you want to think about it that way. So that's called a tetrahedron. Um, and now when we draw this in two dimensions, um, we're going to use the convention that I'll show. So we're gonna, I'm going to draw it sort of in this orientation. So you can't really see my mouse pointer very well on this, unfortunately. Um, but the atom that's vertical and the atom that's going down into the left as you're looking at it. Those would be in the plane of the page as sort of a bent arrangement. And then you have two, one that's coming out towards you and one that's going back away from you into 
the, the board or into the plane of the page. And those are going to be drawn with dashes and wedges, as I'll show you. So we're going to draw that in two dimensions to represent that this is, in fact, a three-dimensional shape. Now, in this case, if we replace one or more of the atoms with a lone pair, again, all four positions in this are equivalent. So where we put that first lone pair doesn't matter. It's going to go in any of these four positions. So we take one of those off and put a lone pair in. Again, the whole arrangement of all the electrons is still going to be tetrahedral. Now one of those is occupied by, in, in this case, we just call it trigonal pyramidal. So it looks, it looks like a pyramid with just three bases, three corners on the pyramid instead of four. So it's called trigonal pyramidal, and that's when we have one lone pair there. And then if we put the second lone pair on, so take one more off and put a second lone pair, now we still have four electron groups. They're going to be arranged in a tetrahedron overall, but then if we look at the shape that the atoms occupy, that's going to be bent. So anytime you have only three atoms in the formula, AX2 whatever, so if it's AX2 or AX2E or AX2E2, or we'll see later on AX2E3, anything that has three atoms in the formula only is either going to be linear or bent. So AX2E was linear and AX2E2 is also, sorry, bent, and AX2E2 is also bent. So those are the three possibilities for the tetrahedral electron group arrangement. All right, so we call the electron group arrangement tetrahedral. And so if we have AX4, that would be one where all four of the electron groups are bonded atoms. So the way that we draw a tetrahedron is, again, we, we draw sort of regular bonds showing the two that are in the plane of the page. For the bond that's coming out towards you in three dimensions, we draw that with a solid wedge. And then for the bond that's going away from you, we draw that with a dashed wedge. So that's what that convention means. You're going to have to get used to this, especially if you take organic chemistry next semester. We're going to use these dashes and wedges all the time. So again, the, the wedge, the solid one, which sometimes is drawn shaded in, although I won't usually shade it in myself just because it takes longer. Um, if it's drawn like that or if it's drawn the way they had it before, that means the bond is coming towards you. If it's drawn with dashes, that means the bond is going away from you. Okay, That's just to indicate that it's three-dimensional and not all four of these are in the same plane. And then for AX4, all four of those positions have bonded atoms X. So it would look like this. And just like the pattern we've been seeing, if there are no lone pairs on the central atom, then the electron group arrangement and the molecular shape have the same name, and they're both called tetrahedral in this case. All right. The bond angle for tetrahedral is not, again, intuitive at all. You could probably rationalize in your head why two electron groups are 180 degrees or why three electron groups are 120. That's not hard, too hard to see. This one is, unless you're, again, a wizard at three-dimensional geometry, not going to come out easily, so you have to remember it. 109.5 is the bond angle between any of these two X atoms on the outside. So that angle there or that angle there, all the bond angles are the same. It's exactly 109.5 degrees for a tetrahedral arrangement. Um, and this picture here sort of shows you why we call it tetrahedral. So if you had your central atom at the middle there, and then those are your four outer atoms, if you use those as the corners of a polyhedron and draw edges through all those, you get four triangular sides, which is why it's called tetrahedron, okay? But you can remember it because it's four things bonded to the central atom, so tetra also makes sense in that case as well. Okay, if we go to AX3E, we still have four total electron groups, three X's and one E now, so a total of four. So that means they're going to arrange themselves in a tetrahedral fashion. And as we said, when you have a tetrahedral electron group arrangement, all four positions are equivalent, so we can put the lone pair anywhere. The way that helps us visualize the shape most easily is that place there. The rest of those will be X's. And so this geometry here, where we have one lone pair, is called trigonal pyramidal. All right, so again, it's like a three-legged stool or a three-legged pyramid, where you have three of those atoms at the bottom, and then the A is sort of on the top of the pyramid. All right, so we call that trigonal pyramidal. The bond angles will be close to, but not exactly, 109.5. Um, so again, there's going to be that repulsion from the lone pair sort of pushing down on all those X's. That's going to almost like close the umbrella a little bit. And so those bond angles will be a little bit less than 109.5. Okay, so it's going to be a little bit smaller because the lone pair is again going to push a little bit harder. It's going to repel those more strongly. So you'll get a slightly smaller angle, but still pretty close to the tetrahedral bond angle. So examples that have these electron group arrangements would be 
The classic AX4 molecule is CH4. So carbon very often has a tetrahedral electron group arrangement. If it's bonded to four things, it will. And then for AX3E, the most classic example is ammonia NH3, which has one lone pair on nitrogen. Um, and in this case, the bond angles for NH3, if you want to know, like, how, how much smaller does it get because of this compression? Again, that depends on what molecule you're talking about. It's not going to be the same for all AX3E molecules. But for NH3, the angles are going to be, let me write that as angles so we don't confuse it with less than. The angles are going to be around 107 degrees. So it's like two degrees smaller. It's not a huge difference, but it is noticeable. Okay, so that's kind of what we see for NH3, where again, the lone pair causes the angles to be a little bit smaller. All right, so that's AX4 and AX3E. Both of them have, again, tetrahedral electron group arrangements and these two possible geometries. And the last one that has four electron group arrangements would be AX2E2. So for AX2E2, again, is four total electron groups, two X's and two E's. So the steric number or the total number is four. So they're going to still be in that tetrahedral shape, but now two of those positions are going to be lone pairs. But again, all four positions are equivalent, so it doesn't matter where we put the first lone pair, it also doesn't matter where we put the second. Any two of these can be lone pairs. So you can put them there and there, for example, and that's what it'll look like. But then um, I think the easier way to write it and to sort of visualize the shape is to take this whole thing and turn it over on its side from where I have it now. So let me go back to the visualizer. So for AX2, E2, the way I originally drew it was sort of like, oh, come on, sort of like this, which is not the easiest way to see what's going on. So the easier way to see it is to sort of rotate it like this. And then you can clearly see that it's a bent arrangement of those three atoms with the two lone pairs sort of coming out towards you and going away from you, um, occupying space but not accounted for in the molecular shape. So the better way to draw this is just, again, to more clearly indicate that it is bent would be like this. And then you have the two lone pairs into and out of, which are hard to draw in this orientation, but they're still there. Um, all right, so again, this arrangement is going to be also bent. Again, you'll sometimes see that called V-shaped, although bent is much more common. It's still like flashing all the time. So that's going to be an example of AX2E2, which is bent. So again, three atoms in the structure. AX2, whatever, it's going to be either linear or bent. Those are your only two options. This one is an example of a bent one. All right, the bond angle will again be something less than 109.5 because of the lone pairs. The classic example of this is water. So as I already showed you earlier, water has a bent shape. It has two lone pairs on oxygen and then two hydrogens. So that's your AX2E2. And the bond angle for this, if I remember correctly, is around 105 degrees. So it gets even a little bit smaller because again, now we have two lone pairs instead of one. So they're gonna push even harder on these two bonds and sort of fold them up even a little bit more. But it's still not all that different from 109.5. Still a lot closer to that than to 120 or 90, for example. Okay, so it's still pretty close to 109.5, but a little bit smaller because of the lone pairs in water that comes down to about 105. All right, so that's four electron groups. So we're about halfway there, yes. Do we have to draw the dashes or the boxes on the second? Uh, this one here. I mean, technically what this one would have is, you don't always show it with the lone pairs in this way. This would have sort of one lone pair coming out towards you and one lone pair going away from you like that. So in this case, you can draw the three atoms all on the same plane, but the lone pairs would be the ones that are showing out towards you and away from you with dashes and wedges. But um, a lot of times we either don't show the lone pairs explicitly, or if we do, sometimes we just put them as dots anyway, so we don't really indicate where they are. We will just draw them like that, for example. So there's a lot, there's a few different ways that you'll see it, but yeah, in this case, the way I've drawn it, the lone pairs would be the ones that would be in and out of the page. Any other questions? Um, and again, as it's fairly obvious by now, you're not going to have to draw anything in Blackboard, but you're going to have to identify shapes and to answer questions about them. That's really what we're getting to in terms of the, the types of problems you'll see. All right, so now we're going to move on to five electron groups, which in some ways is the weirdest one. So let's go to that in the simulator and do five electron groups. So we're going to start with just five atoms now. So two, three, four, five. All right, so this one, again, you have to think in three dimensions a little bit. So this one is, and this one's hard because it folds up on itself when I try to rotate. There we go, right like that. Okay, 
So what you can hopefully see in this orientation for five electron groups, what we have is three of them form a triangle. So if I, if I carefully rotate this in this way, you can hopefully see that. So three of the atoms form a triangle, and then there's going to be basically a flagpole coming out above and below that triangle. So the fourth and fifth atoms go straight up out of the triangle or straight down from the bottom of the triangle. So that's how those five things arrange themselves. Now the one thing as we'll talk about that's different about this one is you actually have two different bond angles because in the triangle you still have those typical 120 degree angles for three atoms arranged in a triangle but then for those apical atoms, the flagpoles as I, as I called them before, the angle between this and any of the nearest one is going to be 90 degrees instead. So you have two different bond angles in this molecule, 120 degrees for the atoms that are in the triangle and then 90 for the ones that are above and below to their nearest. Uh, next atom on the on the central atom. So that's going to be called trigonal bipyramidal. So trigonal meaning that there's a triangular base and then bipyramidal because you have one sticking up above and below the uh, the plane of that triangle. So the only another difference with AX5 is that in this case it does matter where we put the lone pairs because as I said we want the lone pairs to be as far away from everything else as possible. And here we have two different positions. We have the positions on the triangle that are 120 degrees from everything else and then 90 degrees from the top ones, or we have the positions on the top and bottom that are 90 degrees from the triangle. And it's not necessarily obvious which one of those is better for minimizing electron-electron repulsions. Because again, we have a choice. So we put the lone pairs on the triangle or at the top for reasons that are not, again, obvious or intuitive necessarily. It's a little bit better to put the lone pairs on the triangle. So if we replace one of those atoms with a lone pair and then try to get it back in the same orientation, what we will see eventually, eventually, come on, it, 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 this, the only thing I don't like about the simulator is that they, they fold up the structures if you rotate them too much, so then it like totally changes the orientation. So there we go. So in that case, you can see that the lone pair went on the triangle. So it's a little bit better to have the lone pair on the triangle. And it turns out for eight, for five electron groups, any of the trigonal bipyramidal arrangements, it's always better to have the lone pairs on the triangles. You're never going to put a lone pair on the top or bottom position. So if we put a second lone pair on there, um, same story. Now I have to get, get it back to where it was. So you put both lone pairs on the triangle. And then if you put a third lone pair, Again, all three now go on the triangle. So however many lone pairs you have, you're never going to have more than three in a, in a you know, five electron group structure. Whether it's one, two, or three lone pairs, they always go on that triangular base of the trigonal bipyramid. So again, it may not be obvious why it's better to do that, but that's what happens and it's fairly easy to remember as a result. Okay, so if we go back to drawing them on paper now, so again, the electron group arrangement for this is called trigonal bipyramidal. So for all of these structures that have five electron groups, that would be your electron group arrangement, the arrangement of all of the valence electrons. All right, and then we can start drawing out the different possibilities. So AX5, where all five of your electron groups are bonded atoms. Again, the way we can draw this is the triangle is going to be sort of sideways in this case. So these three here would be your triangle where one of them is coming out towards you, one of them is going away, and then you have the apical positions showing up and bound in this orientation. So for AX5, all five of those are going to be bonded atoms X. And then another way to draw this which more clearly shows the triangle would be to draw an actual triangle around the central atom and then have it's shown like that. So there's a couple ways of drawing this. This one might be a little bit easier to see the triangular base and then again one coming up or down below that. So as I said we have two different bond angles in this. First again because there's no lone pairs the molecular shape is the same as the electron group arrangement, trigonal bipyramidal. So that's always going to be the case when you have zero lone pairs on the central atom. But we have two different bond angles in this case. So as we talked about if you have the bond angles on the triangle, I'll do those in blue. So that angle there, for example, or that angle there, all the bond angles involving the three atoms on the triangle are going to be that usual 120 degree value that we got for trigonal planar. But we also have a second bond angle, which I'll draw in red here, which would be from the apical atoms to any of the three 
triangle uh, position, or what we call the equatorial positions. So those angles there, or any of the other ones that involve the top or bottom atom, are going to be 90 degrees. I'll draw that one as 120. All right, so there's two different bond angles in these trigonal bipyramidal structures involving the three apical, or sorry, the three equatorial or triangular atoms that are 120, or any of the ones involving the top and bottom, which will be 90. Okay, an example of this is going to be PCL5. That's one example where you have five electron groups all around your center atom, no lone pairs. Okay, so if we get to AX4E now, um, we have one lone pair, and as we said when we were going through the simulator, if we have five electron groups, they're always going to be trigonal bipyramidal, and for this structure, it does matter where we put the lone pairs, and all the lone pairs we have, whether it's one, two, or three, are going to go in one of these triangular positions. So any of these three positions is fine. So one of those is going to be a lone pair. The rest will be the bonded atoms X. Now this structure is one that is somewhat hard to visualize, especially if I draw it like this. If we turn it over on its side, it makes it a little bit more obvious what, why we call it what it is. So we're going to turn this whole thing over on its side, where now the apical atoms are shown sideways, horizontally. And then we have one coming out towards you, one going away from you, and one more, and then your lone pair there. So those are going to be X's. So what we call this geometry is going to be seesaw. And your bond angles are going to be somewhere, again, a little bit less than 120 and 90, although we don't usually need to talk about them in detail for this structure. And an example of this would be SF4. All right, so it's, again, why do we call it Seesaw? Maybe the picture isn't doing it justice, so let's go back to the simulator real quick, see if we can understand why that is. So for Seesaw, where we have... AX4E. So what I did was I put it in sort of, oh, how did I do that? This orientation here. Nope, see it keeps folding up on itself. There we go. So we did it like that. And so this is like a seesaw, like that, like that. So imagine that it's rocking like that. That's why we call it seesaw. So this is the one that a lot of people mess up for whatever reason. Even when I teach this at a higher level, this is the one that confuses the most people. But it's called a seesaw geometry, and if you turn it on the side, that makes it a little bit more obvious why that's the case. Okay, so that's called seesaw, and again, a classic example of that is SF4. Now with five electron groups, we still have two more possibilities that can have two or three lone pairs in, this, in the structure. So if we have AX3E2, total of five electron groups, so we're going to have a trigonal bipyramidal arrangement. And two of those positions on the triangle are now going to be lone pairs. Again, it doesn't matter which two, they're all 120 degrees apart. But we'll put those two, that makes it easier to see the shape that's going to result from this. All right, and this one again is maybe sideways from where it should be to clearly see it, but you can hopefully see that the, the atoms in this structure make up approximately a T-shape. That's what we call this geometry, T-shaped. All right. All right, so again, if you want to see that in three dimensions, um, add one more, take one off. So this is called T-shaped, where if we draw it in that orientation, you can clearly see why we call it T-shaped. All right. The way that I drew it in the notes is more like that there, okay? But it's called T-shaped, where now you have basically 90 degree angles. A little bit smaller because the lone pairs are going to, again, compress that a little bit, but basically 90 degree angles in a, a flat shape in this case for those four atoms. All right, so this is T-shaped. Bond angles are close to, but in reality, a little bit less than 90 degrees because of the repulsion from the lone pairs, but still close to 90 degrees. And an example of this would be IF3. So there's these what are called inner halogen compounds that are made up of all halogen atoms with usually iodine at the center. So that's an example of a T-shaped molecule, IF3. All right, so that's T-shaped. And then the last possibility for five electron groups, we can have as many as three lone pairs, AX2E3, 
All right, so five electron groups that are going to be in a trigonal bipyramidal arrangement with then three of those, all three on the triangle, being lone pairs in this case. So if we put lone pairs in all of those triangular positions, what we can hopefully easily see is that the two atoms, X, are now 180 degrees apart. So again, if there's three atoms in the formula, your only two possibilities are linear and bent. This one ends up being linear when you have three lone pairs. Okay, so this is a linear geometry where that's 180 degree bond angles. And this time they're exactly 180 degrees because you have lone pairs repelling in both directions equally. So these lone pairs are going to be pushing up on that one, but they're also going to be pushing down on the bottom one. So that push is the same in both directions, so those are going to still remain exactly 180 degrees apart. They're not going to be compressing together in any way. So exactly 180 degrees, and this is not the most common electron group arrangement, but there are real examples of it. And one of them that's kind of a cool compound is xenon difluoride. So we talk about the noble gases as not making compounds at all. That's why they're called noble or inert. But there are rare examples of compounds that involve noble gases at the central atom. And particularly xenon with fluorine can make two different common compounds, xenon difluoride being one of them, which would have three lone pairs on the central atom and the two fluorines arranged in a linear fashion. So that's the last possibility for five electron groups. So again, in some ways, five electron groups is the most complicated because you have two different positions and you have to know that the lone pairs always go on those triangular positions. Once you do that, the shapes are, in most cases, pretty easy to visualize, with maybe the exception of seesaw being one that you'll have to look at a little bit to, to get the hang of it. All right, so any questions on that? Okay, the last set that we're going to do is six electron groups. This is as high as we're going to go. Um, so for six electron groups, let's talk about first electron group arrangement. All right, so if we go to the simulator here, and let's do a total of six electron groups, all as atoms at first. All right, that's as high as it'll let us go. If you try to add more than that, it doesn't let you. So this is as high as the simulator goes, and this is as high as this class goes. Here's what it looks like for six electron groups. Um, so what you'll see is if we rotate it like this, you can see we now have four atoms that make a square around the central atom, and then one going above the square, one going below the square. So in some cases, similar, in some ways, similar to trigonal bipyramidal, but now we have a square base instead of a triangular base. But in this situation, all the bond angles are the same. They're all exactly 90 degrees apart from each other, so all the positions are equivalent in this, in this structure. Um, now what we call this, though, is not the most intuitive name. It's called octahedral. So it has only six things, but it's called octahedral, which means eight. The reason is if you draw triangles through each of the three adjacent atoms, you'll get eight triangles, four on the top, four on the bottom. So it's an eight-sided shape, which I think I have a picture of that in the notes, maybe, so I'll show it to you. Um, but anyway, that's called octahedral, and we have six electron groups. So with uh, six electron groups, there's going to be two substructures that have lone pairs involved. Um, so one of those is going to have one lone pair, um, and then the other one will have two. So that's as high as we'll go for, for that. So if you have one lone pair, all of the positions, as I said, are equivalent. They're all 90 degrees apart from each other. So the lone pair can go wherever you want. So we can take one of those off and put a lone pair. Again, the, everything's going to be arranged in octahedron. The best way to see this structure is to put the lone pair on the bottom. And so then what this is called is square pyramidal. Okay, because what you have is, again, your square base, as you can see more clearly in that orientation, and now you just have one atom coming out of the square. So it's basically a pyramid with a square base. Kind of like, I think that's how the pyramids in Egypt are, but correct me if I'm wrong because I don't know my history very well. But anyway, it's a square base with one atom coming out the top, and that's called a square pyramid, pyramid structure, square pyramidal. All right, and then if we put a second lone pair on, it doesn't matter where the first one goes. All the positions are equivalent. But if we have two lone pairs in the structure, we want those two to be as far apart from each other as possible. So if we're putting the first lone pair on the bottom here, the second one needs to go as far away from that, which would be, in this case, the top position, as I've drawn, 180 degrees apart. So if you have two lone pairs in an octahedral arrangement, they're going to go exactly opposite each other like that. Okay? They, they need to be 180 degrees apart instead of 90 degrees apart. And then what we call this structure, if you look at the atoms that are left, that's just a square, or square planar is the more technical term for that. 
So when you have two lone pairs, they're going to go opposite each other and leaving that square base still with the four atoms around the center atom. All perfectly flat, all exactly 90 degree bond angles. Okay, so those are the three possibilities for six electron groups. So we call the electron group arrangement octahedral. And I guess I don't have a good picture of an octahedron here, but again, if you draw triangles through all those sides, there's going to be eight triangles in the, in the shapes. That's why I call it octahedral. And then for AX6, we're going to put those six atoms around that octahedron. So the way to draw this is a couple ways. One would be with the dashes and wedges. So we would have two atoms coming out towards you and two going away from you. That's your square. And then one coming up above and below the square like this. Or the other way to draw it, which is sometimes easier to visualize, would be to actually draw the square with your four X's on it. And then, as I said, one atom coming out of the square, one atom going below the square like that. So that's your octahedral structure. Okay? A square bipyramid would be another way to say that. But it's, it's more officially called octahedral. So when you have six electron groups and no lone pairs, again, we have no lone pairs on the center atom, the same pattern. The molecular geometry is the same name as the electron group arrangement. And for this structure, the bond angles are exactly 90 degrees. So the angle between any two adjacent x's is going to be exactly 90 degrees. All right, so the, to the closest one. Sorry, I missed an x down there. I should go in there. All right, so that's going to be octahedral. Um, and again, it's not the most common thing that we'll see in Lewis structures and in real molecules, but there are compounds that have this. For example, SF6. So you can have sulfur hexafluoride is a real molecule, and that would be octahedral. No lone pairs in sulfur, but six fluorines bonded to it. Now, the nice thing is, if you, this reminds me of a shortcut that you should be aware of. If we're asking you to, you know, something about the shape of a molecule, and it has six things bonded to the central atom, like SF6, then the no-brainer answer is octahedral, because there are no AX6E structures. If, it's, if it has six things bonded to the central atom, it has to be AX6. This is many, you can have no more than six electron groups on the central atom. So if it's SF6, or if it's PF6 minus, where you have six things bonded to the central atom, it has to be octahedral. There's no other, no other possibility there. If it's less than six, then you have to go through and figure out how many lone pairs there are and, and all the whole shebang. But for six things, it has to be octahedral, so you don't have to necessarily go through as much detail on that. Now for AX5E, what we said is you can put the lone pair wherever you want. So you start with the octahedral arrangement. The lone pair can go in any of these six positions. If we put it on the bottom, that's the easiest to help us visualize what this structure is called. And this would be called square pyramidal. So again, it's a square base with just now one atom coming off the top, so it's basically a pyramid with a square base. And the bond angles in this case are a little bit less than 90 degrees because that lone pair is going to pinch up on the atoms that are in the square plane and sort of fold them up a little bit from, from perfectly planar arrangement with, with A. So it's going to be a little bit less than 90 degrees, but again, so close to that because it's based on the octahedral arrangement. And an example of a real molecule that has this shape would be, oh no, did I lose my pen? Shoot. All right, I'm going to have to crap again. All right, I, w I do want to finish this because we still have a lot of time left. So let me save this. I'm probably going to have to restart my tablet because that seems to be the only way that I can get out of this mess. All right, we're back from our unplanned commercial break, and all that's left to do is get the pointer back up, and we're ready to roll. All right, um, so as I had just finished saying, an example of AX5E is IF5, so another one of those inner halogen compounds. All right, and then the last possibility with six electron groups is going to be, I'm recording, right? I'm not like going crazy, yeah. Sorry, the last possibility is gonna be with two lone pairs on the central atom. So if we have AX4E2, 
we're going to have the octahedral arrangement. And as we said, in this case, if you have two lone pairs, you want them to be as far apart from each other as possible. They repel more strongly than any bonding pair, so you put them 180 degrees apart. So if you have two, it does matter where they go relative to each other. The first one can go anywhere, but the second one has to go 180 degrees from the first. And then that's going to be this structure, which if you draw it in the plane of the page would be just a square like that where the lone pairs in this case would be coming exactly out towards you and exactly away from you, but the, the four atoms are arranged in a square plane around the center atom. So we call this square planar. I had an old grumpy professor in grad school who insisted we should just call it square because it was a square plane, um, but that's an argument for a different day. And the name square planar is still what you're going to most commonly see, and the bond angles are exactly 90 degrees. All right, again, exactly 90 degrees because we have lone pairs on the top and the bottom that are pushing equally. So everything is going to stay then in that plane where the lone pair is going to push down, that lone pair is pushing up, so the whole thing stays flat to, to keep it as far away from those lone pairs as possible. And again, the, the example that I'll give for this one, which we might see later, is called xenon tetrafluoride. It's another one of those xenon fluoride compounds. So AX4E2 is not very common in, in real molecules but there's one example that would have two lone pairs in the center atom and the four atoms then arranged in a square plane. Okay, so that's all the possibilities we have. Um, we'll summarize this at the end. So any questions on, on VSCPR up until now? All right, so let's, the next thing we're gonna cover is a little bit more detail about bond angles. So we talked about how you know, bond angles can be, you know, they're ideally defined by the electron group arrangement. So 180 degrees for linear, 120 degrees for trigonal planar, 109.5 for tetrahedral, and so on. But that sometimes you can have slight deviations from those, where in most cases that means the angles are a little bit less than their ideal. So we already saw that lone pairs can cause bond angle compression. So if you have a structure that has one or more lone pairs, in many cases those bond angles will be a little bit smaller than the ideal value. Now the other groups that can cause bond angle compression would be double and triple bonds. So we still only count these as one electron group when we're counting up sort of the AXE notation and sort of figuring out the shape from there. But if you have a double or a triple bond, they have four or six shared electrons instead of two, so that is going to push a little bit more strongly on the atoms that are nearby. So if you have double or triple bonds, you'll still be, again, very close to that ideal geometry, but those, those double and triple bonds might you know, change the structure a little bit. So if we have this example here, let me do a better one. So let's do, this is called formaldehyde. All right, so if we look at our central carbon atom, there's three things bonded to it. So ideally, they should be 120 degrees apart because it's trigonal planar and no lone pairs. But we have a double bond instead of a single bond there, so that's going to push a little bit more on those, more strongly than the single bonds because there's four electrons instead of two in a double bond. So that angle there would be maybe a little bit smaller than 120 degrees, and the other two angles would be then a little bit bigger because those hydrogen atoms are going to get a little bit further away from, from the double bond in oxygen. So that's the prediction we would make. That doesn't always quite work out that perfectly, especially when you have two different types of atoms bonded to the center atom. Um, but nonetheless, that's sort of a, another minor effect, one that we're not going to really worry about too much, but just to be aware of. And then the other thing to remember when we're arranging lone pairs around the center atom is that lone pair, lone pair repulsion is the strongest. So if you have more than one lone pair in your central atom, those are going to be the ones that want to get as far away from each other as possible, more so than the atoms themselves, because the, ad, the electrons that are in lone pairs, they're not you know, bound between two atoms, they're kind of out there in space as a lone pair, and so they have stronger repulsion than any bonding pairs. So that's just a little bit more things about bond pairs, electron-electron repulsion, and how that thing, how that can determine things. Um, again, most of it we've already covered when we went through all the geometry, so we don't really need to say too much more about that. So let's just go through a few examples then. Is this, is this the last thing I have, I think? Yeah, just like a few examples and then a summary. So um, let's just practice this approach. So let's determine the molecular shape of PCL3. So this would be you know, one classic type of problem. You might have to answer questions about the shape or other you know, variations on this, but the very first thing you'll have to do is determine the shape. 
So if we just give you the formula, the first thing you need to be able to do is to draw a good Lewis structure for that molecule. Again, we don't have to get too tied up in double bonds, triple bonds, and formal charges and all that stuff, but we need to at least know the arrangement of the valence electrons around the central atom. So let's go through that in the full, in all of its glory. So if we have PCL3, we can count the electrons. Let's get my periodic table pulled up. Oh, that's the wrong periodic table. Let's close that. All right, well, we'll just keep this one, okay. All right, so if we look at our periodic table here, PCL3, phosphorus is group five, so there's five valence, stop, five valence electrons, and then chlorine is group seven, so there'd be seven each. So we count valence electrons first. This is a review of Lewis structures, which we should be very good at by now and need to do for this first exam. So that's five electrons from phosphorus. Each chlorine is seven, because they're group seven. So that's 21. I think we might have done this Lewis structure in class also. So this is a bit, a bit of a, a really bit of a review. So when we draw the Lewis structure for PCL3, we start with the three atoms single bonded. We complete their octets. So at this point we have eight on each chlorine for a total of 24. 8, 16, 24. There's 26 total in the structure, so the last two have to go in the center atom like that. All right, now again, we don't have to worry about whether or not there are double bonds or whether or not there's formal charges. In, in this case, there's nothing, we're done. This is the final structure. But what we want to do then is then translate this into a molecular geometry. So we look at the structure that we have. If we focus on our central atom phosphorus, it has three atoms bonded to it. It's PCL3, so that you can tell from the formula and it has one lone pair on the central atom as well. So this would be an AX3E structure. Three atoms, one lone pair on the central atom, total of four electron groups, three plus one is four, and so those are gonna be in a tetrahedral arrangement. One of those is gonna be a lone pair, doesn't matter which one, and then the chlorines go in the other spots. So that would be a three-dimensional representation of PCL3, and the name for that molecular shape is trigonal pyramidal. All right, so determining the shape is just getting a Lewis structure, figuring out, again, the AXE notation, if that's helpful for you, and then translating that into a shape. Now, you could do this by brute force memorization, but what I encourage you to do is be able to visualize the structures, definitely know those five electron group arrangements really well, because that's sort of the basis of everything, but then you don't have to memorize all the possibilities. Know where the lone pairs go, and then you'll be able to see the picture of the structure you've drawn and be able to translate that into the correct name without having to, again, rack your brain too much. So that's how I encourage you to do this. If we just do a few more here. So if we go to carbonate, CO3, 2 minus. Um, I'm gonna wing this because I don't have any notes here. So for CO3, 2 minus, uh, we're running a little bit low on time, so I won't go through all the details on that. But what you should get for the Lewis structure would be this. So in this case, you would have So this is CO3 2 minus. You have one double bond in the structure. You technically have two resonance structures if we want to be really complete. Again, but we don't need all those details just to do the VSCPR approach. Now in this case, there has to be a double bond because otherwise you won't have a complete octet on your central atom. But even if we didn't do that, even if we didn't draw all the, the sort of you know, resonance contributors, even if we totally forgot about the double bond, we would still come to the same prediction about the molecular shape. Because what we have at our central atom here is three atoms bonded to it from the three oxygens in the formula, but then we have no lone pairs on the central atom. So again, whether or not you draw this double bond or not, it should be there, but that's not going to change the AXE notation. So it's going to be AX3E0 or just more simply AX3. Okay. So it's three things on the central atom, no lone pairs. So whenever we have three things, it's going to be a trigonal planar arrangement. And if we're drawing these, again, there's resonance structures, so you'd have sort of these dotted lines indicating that it's between a single and a double bond. However you want to draw that, we don't need the lone pairs on all the outer atoms, but it would be trigonal planar. So the VSCPR approach is a little bit forgiving in terms of your Lewis structure because you don't need to have the double bond there or you don't need to have all the resonance structures to be able to predict 
that is AX3, and then that makes it trigonal planar is the correct geometry that you would have. Okay, so your Lewis structure doesn't need to be totally perfect, it just needs to have the correct number of valence electrons on the center atom. So make sure you don't put extra lone pairs or leave lone pairs off, that should be there. All right, maybe just one or two more examples. I think this is the last one, yeah. Last example, xenon tetrafluoride. I gave this as an example before, but let's see how we would predict the shape of this from scratch. So for xenon tetrafluoride, let's count the valence electrons real quickly for this one, because it's a little bit more complicated. Um, all right, so xenon is a noble gas. So again, noble gases don't typically make compounds, but they can in rare cases. So it would have eight valence electrons. It'd be the, is this 5P, 5S2, 5P, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So it's in group eight, so it has eight valence electrons. Each fluorine is gonna contribute seven, because it's in group seven. All right, so we have eight valence electrons from xenon. We have four times seven from the fluorine. So that's going to be 36. Why does that keep blinking? This is All right, so that's going to be 36 valence electrons. So we draw the Lewis structure of this. I'm going to help myself a little bit by not putting them too closely together. So we have four fluorines. So we draw single bonds first. We complete the octets of the outer atoms first. Remember, that's always the first thing we do. All right, so we've completed four octets for each of the four fluorines. That's four times eight is 32. Our total structure has 36. That means we have four more for the central atom. So we're going to put two lone pairs here on the central xenon. So when we translate this structure to the AXE notation, there's four bonded atoms. So it's AX4, but now we have two lone pairs in the central atom, so AX4E2. All right, so that's the AXE notation, and then to get the molecular shape, it's six electron groups, so xenon at the center. Six electron groups means octahedral arrangement. Two lone pairs have to go 180 degrees apart, and so that leaves this structure here, which is called square planar. All right, so this is probably the only common or relatively common neutral molecule that would be square planar, at least of the main group elements that we're talking about. So that would be the correct shape for this. All right, so that's just three related examples. You just have to draw a reasonably good Lewis structure, at least make sure you have the correct number of lone pairs on the center atom, and then from there translate it to a shape. So the last slide, I don't need to say anything, but it's just a summary of everything we covered today. I guess there's one more here that I didn't quite fit, but AX2E3, which is linear. All right, so don't forget about that one. It's not very common, but it can show up. So this summarizes, again, steric number, which gives you the electron group arrangement and then the different possibilities with lone pairs. So I don't encourage you to memorize this table front and back, but it's a helpful guide for you as you're learning this. As you draw more of these structures, hopefully they'll internalize and you won't have to think about it too much. All right, so next time we'll continue on with some of the consequences of the three-dimensional shape that it has on the properties and move through other Chapter 4 topics.